I'm honored to provide this message from my grandfather, President Jimmy Carter. He said, I can think of no greater recipient for the National Museum of American History's Great Americans Medal than Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, a powerful legal mind and a staunch advocate for gender equality and human rights she was a beacon of justice during her long and remarkable career. I was proud to have appointed her to the U.S. Court of Appeals in 1980, and we join you all in celebrating her contributions to our great nation and send our warmest, best wishes on this special evening. Thank you. It was my honor to serve alongside Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg for 15 of her 27 years as a member of the Supreme Court of the United States. Prior to that, it was my more stressful honor to argue before her as an advocate in the court. But her contributions to the court and to the law began decades earlier. As a law student in the 1950s and a law professor in the 60s and 70s, she helped pave the way for women in the legal field. As an advocate, she argued six important cases before the Supreme Court, winning five. As a judge of the United States Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit, and then an Associate Justice of the Supreme Court, she modeled excellence in the craft over more than four decades on the bench. Throughout, she inspired countless others to better understand our Constitution and to see opportunity and promise in our country. I am delighted that the Smithsonian's National Museum of American History is honoring Justice Ginsburg with its Great Americans Medal. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Smithsonian's National Museum of American History and to this Women's History Month capstone event. I'm Dr. Anthea M. Hartig, the Elizabeth McMillan Director of the museum, and it's truly my privilege to be your host today as we posthumously present the Great Americans Medal to Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Thank you for joining us from all corners of the nation and perhaps even the world to witness this historic moment. The National Museum of American History is located in the greater Washington DC area. And we gratefully acknowledge the precedence of the Piscataway, Pamunkey, and Acostean tribes and their descendants. The Chesapeake Bay region is home to many indigenous people from all over the hemisphere. So wherever we are, let us acknowledge and give our respect and gratitude to Native peoples, the opportunity to work and to live in their territories. Today, we honor Justice Ginsburg's enduring impact on American history. As a lawyer, as a jurist, as a trailblazer who fought to dismantle discrimination against defendants, deny due process and equal protection under the law. We are deeply grateful to her children, Professor Jane C. Ginsburg and James Ginsburg, who join us here today to accept the medal on their mother's behalf. Later in the program, the Ginsburgs will donate artifacts reflecting the justices' Supreme Court career and speak with me about their mother's rich and multi-partite legacy. We thank them so much for their extraordinary gifts to the American people. The Great Americans Medal Award Program is supported by David M. Rubenstein. The medal, struck in 1.85 ounces of fine gold, is made possible by museum board member Jeff Garrett. The inspiration was the museum's rare double eagle coins, designed by sculptor Augustus Sankadan, enlisted by President Theodore Roosevelt to design the $20 gold piece. The medal features an American eagle with sun rays on the head side, and the reverse side honors the museum's star-spangled banner and the Smithsonian's mission for the increase and diffusion of knowledge. We've asked other notable Americans to help us pay tribute to Justice Ginsburg and her importance as a truly great American. Please join me in watching this video. I'm honored to stand in the company of Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg as a recipient of the Smithsonian's Great Americans Medal. Ruth Bader Ginsburg quite simply changed the way the world is for American women, and she did it before she became a Supreme Court Justice. Justice Ginsburg 
was an equality and civil rights champion who fought tirelessly for a better tomorrow. For more than a decade until her first judicial appointment in 1980, she led the fight in the courts for gender equality. When she began her legal crusade, women were treated by law differently from men. Thousands of state and federal laws restricted what women could do, barring them from jobs, rights, and even from jury service. By the time she put on judicial robes, though, Ruth Ginsburg had wrought a revolution. Ruth Bader Ginsburg believed that if women had equal rights and opportunity, they could do anything and everything. And she showed that in her own life. And of course, she spent 27 years on the Supreme Court fighting for those rights for all of the rest of us and we're forever in her debt. On the Supreme Court, RBG wrote landmark opinions and fierce dissents, and she did something others could never have imagined. She became a feminist icon for girls and women of all ages, and she did it in her 80s. In one of her earliest cases that she argued against the Supreme Court was to argue for equal pay and equal benefits for military women. At the time, we still had the WAC, the Women's Army Corps. And because of this ruling that she won, uh, I was able to serve on equal footing as men in my 23 years career in the National Guard. Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg was a great American because she believed in this country. Her love for America was unwavering, unyielding. For all of her life, Ruth Ginsburg understood that we are Americans without adjectives. Her belief in the founding documents, our Constitution, our Bill of Rights was resolute. But she understood that in order for justice to be fully inclusive in this country, there was work to do. I had the great pleasure and privilege of working with her on some ACLU cases, and also of visiting her in her book-lined office at the Supreme Court. There was never a moment when I did not trust her opinion on all that came before us in life, and when she was not the best kind of teacher, one who encourages and allows us to be our best selves. Although I only met her once, I felt a kinship with Justice Ginsburg because of her passion for equality and justice. I wasn't surprised when I found out we shared a passion for the play Anne and Emmett, a powerful denunciation of hatred and bigotry expressed as an imaginary conversation between Anne Frank and Emmett Till. It speaks to Judge Ginsburg's lifelong determination to fight injustice and intolerance. For us here at the Kennedy Center, we love Ruth also for her fervent belief in the arts and her consuming passion for opera, which brought her to the Kennedy Center so often and led her from being a participant in the audience to a participant on the stage. Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg was an inspiration to me. In Judaism, there's a saying meant to bring comfort when someone dies. It goes like this, may their memory be a blessing. May Justice Ginsburg's indelible legacy shine bright in all of our memories and remind us that the fight for justice is never easy. Her strength, courage, and sense of justice created an impact for generations to come. We respect her, we admire her, and we love her. She was a great American with an amazing strength. And as my friend Sally Jenkins wrote, there was strength in her words, strength in her visage, strength in her arguments. It is the job of every single person to ensure her legacy lives on. Thank you so much to all of our tribute participants. Now join me in watching a video that traces the arc of Justice Ginsburg's life through her appointment to the United States Supreme Court. We owe a special debt of thanks to Gloria Steinem, the justice's friend and partner in the fight for women's rights for her narration of this video. The Great Americans Medal honors Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg for her groundbreaking judicial work her fierce advocacy for gender equality, and her extraordinary leadership 
in the quest for justice under law. Whatever you choose to do, leave tracks. And that means don't do just for yourself because in the end it's not going to be fully satisfying. You will want to leave the world a little better for your having lived. Ruth Bader Ginsburg was born at Beth Moses Hospital in New York on March 15, 1933. She grew up in a neighborhood of Jewish immigrants in the Flatbush section of Brooklyn. Her mother was deeply influential in her life, encouraging her ambition and her love for the arts. Celia Bader had been forced to drop out of school in order to put her brother through college. She wanted her daughter to have the opportunities that she had been denied. Celia would pass away the day of Ginsburg's high school graduation after a battle with cancer. I pray that I may be all that she would have been had she lived in an age when women could aspire and achieve and daughters are cherished as much as sons. Ginsburg attended Cornell University, graduating in 1954 at the top of her class. At Cornell, she met her husband, Martin Ginsburg, whom she affectionately called Marty. He was the first boy I ever knew who cared that I had a brain. They wed in 1954 and were married for 56 years. Ginsburg had joined Marty at Harvard Law School, where she was one of nine women in a class of over 500 men. When Marty was diagnosed with cancer, Ginsburg helped him recover and graduate on time, all while completing her own degree requirements and caring for their toddler daughter, Jane. When her husband joined a New York law firm, Ginsburg transferred to Columbia Law School, graduating in 1959. Despite her achievements, she struggled to get hired. Although recommended for a Supreme Court clerkship, she wasn't even offered an interview. A 1962 trip to Sweden had a profound impact on her work. While doing legal research on gender equality, she witnessed a culture where working women were the norm. She would say that her thought processes were stimulated in Sweden, and she saw what needed to change in the States. Ginsburg went on to become a professor at Rutgers Law School, and her son James was born in 1965. In 1971, Ginsburg co-founded the Women's Rights Project at the American Civil Liberties Union, where she took on cases that sought to dismantle cultural, gender-based restrictions and to provide gender equality under the law. Her first major case, Reed v. Reed, she challenged an Idaho statute that automatically gave preference to men for appointment as administrator of a deceased person's estate. In another early case, Moritz versus Commissioner of Internal Revenue took on the IRS for denying a man a medical tax deduction to care for his elderly mother solely because of his gender. This landmark ruling was the first time that the Supreme Court held that a law providing differential treatment of men and women violates the 14th Amendment. We wanted to say that the law should not pigeonhole people, that man or woman should be able to do whatever his or her talents made right for that person. At the ACLU, she took part in 34 cases before the United States Supreme Court, serving as lead counsel in six cases, five of which she won. In 1980, Ginsburg was appointed by President Jimmy Carter to the D.C. Circuit Court. President Bill Clinton nominated her to serve as the nation's second female justice on the Supreme Court, 
she took the bench in 1993. Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg understood that even in a democratic society, fear and anger can sometimes cause us to tolerate things we should never tolerate, accept things we should never accept. She believed that bigotry should never be accommodated, that injustice can never be tolerable, that abuse of basic human rights is always unacceptable. I argued cases before the United States Supreme Court and when the other justices would refer to my clients as juveniles and delinquents, she used the word children. In 2012, when we were trying to challenge mandatory life without parole sentences imposed on children, she made the contention to the state that they were advocating that some 14-year-olds be thrown away. She had this ability to get people to understand what the truths are and I'm so privileged to be a part of celebrating her remarkable life. She encouraged me when we met years later to remember that sometimes you don't see what you're doing to kind of make a difference in the world, but you are making a difference. She made an extraordinary difference, and she absolutely should be honored as one of our great Americans. It is my privilege to welcome our great friend and benefactor, former Smithsonian Regent, David M. Rubenstein. David is the co-founder and co-chairman of the Carlyle Group, and he is so much more to that for all of us at the Smithsonian. Oh, I'm David Rubenstein, and I'm here to talk a little bit about Ruth Bader Ginsburg, a friend of mine and somebody I greatly admire. A number of years ago, I worked with the Smithsonian to help create the Great American Series, an award that would be given to great Americans for what they've done to help our country become a better country. These are people like Madeleine Albright or Colin Powell. And Ruth Bader Ginsburg was to receive this award, but shortly before she passed away, uh, we were unable to actually have the ceremony. So as a result, we are going to do this posthumously. But that doesn't detract from the fact that she was an incredible American, somebody I got to know over many, many years from my work at the Kennedy Center, where when, as chairman of the Kennedy Center, I would frequently introduce Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who was in the audience because she loved operas and she came frequently to the operas. Always, we'd get a standing ovation. All the people I've introduced over the years at the Kennedy Center, presidents, vice presidents, secretaries of state, foreign leaders, nobody ever got the ovation that Ruth Bader Ginsburg did. Why is that? Because people recognize she changed the face of history. She made it possible for women to say, yes, we are entitled to and should receive equal rights. Because of her advocacy as a lawyer, her work as a, as a judge and as a justice for some 27 years, she changed the course of history. And for that, we're all in her debt. It's my great regret that I don't have a chance any longer to introduce Ruth Bader Ginsburg at the Kennedy Center or again to interview her. But I hope that all Americans will read about her, will get to know her better, will think about what she did and recognize that her legacy will live on for quite some time. And if anybody ever deserves the title Great American, it is Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Thank you, David. And as David said, we dearly wish that Justice Ginsburg could be with us here today as she had planned before the pandemic precluded her from doing so and before her passing. We are thus eternally grateful to the justice's daughter, Professor Jane C. Ginsburg and her son, James Ginsburg, who are here to accept the Great Americans Medal on their mother's behalf. I am so pleased now to introduce them. Jane is the Morton L. Jankla Professor of Literary and Artistic Property Law at Columbia Law School and the faculty director of Columbia's Kernikan Center for Law, Media, and the Arts. James is the founder and president of the Chicago-based classical label, Sedil Records, an innovative nonprofit label with a mission to produce and share recordings presenting the finest classical music performers and composers of Greater Chicago. Welcome to you both, and thank you so very much for participating. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I hope you and your families have been as well as possible. So now on to the award presentation. 
just as Ruth Bader Ginsburg truly was a great American, and it is my extraordinary privilege to posthumously award her the museum's highest honor, the Great Americans Medal. Please allow me to read the medal citation. The National Museum of American History proudly presents the Great Americans Medal to Ruth Bader Ginsburg for her groundbreaking judicial work, her advocacy for gender equality, and extraordinary leadership in a quest for justice under the law. For her intellect, integrity, courage, dedication, and belief in the beauty of the arts, and for inspiring generations of women and girls to carve our own paths. Through these values and achievements as a brilliant jurist who worked tirelessly to create a more just and compassionate future, she defined service at the highest level and thus embodied the true meaning of a great American, March 30th, 2022. My brother James and I are honored and deeply moved to accept this posthumous award to our mother, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. And this, uh, this is the award. My remarks will address the first part of the citation that Anthea just read, and James's will go to the second part. As a judge and a justice, Mother's judicial work was not groundbreaking in the sense of earth shattering. Most judicial work evolves within the constraints of precedent and care for the integrity of the institution. What mother would call path marking opinions, in fact, build on common principles while showing the new directions toward which they can lead. Sometimes when judicial colleagues go astray, those opinions show Congress the route to course correction, as with her celebrated Lily Ledbetter dissent. Mother was a determined advocate for gender equality, but never so fierce as to lose sight of her own guidance to fight for the things that you care about, but do it in a way that will lead others to join you. Her quest for justice under law sought to achieve a more perfect union by embracing all the people within we the people of the United States of America. The second part of the medal citations preamble that uh, was read uh, highlights our mother's belief in the beauty of the arts and credits her with inspiring generations of women and girls to carve their own paths. It is that belief and my parents' enthusiasm in sharing their love of music in particular that led me to trace my own path as a producer of classical recordings and head of a nonprofit with a mission to promote great classical musicians in my hometown of Chicago. Watching mom share her passionate love of opera has proven infectious, not just for me, but for everyone in her orbit as scores of former law clerks, for example, can attest. Mom has inspired so many women of all ages because they saw her blazing trails at a time when few paths other than the mommy track existed for most women. She defied the odds and thereby increased opportunities for all the women and girls who followed after her. She did this by breaking through stereotypes about what women could and could not do, showing how strong and capable the, quote, weaker sex truly was. By example, she showed that no matter how far away a dream may seem, there is a way to get there if you're willing to put the work in. I believe she also inspired generations of men, myself included, to become more equal sharers in the household and especially in the raising of children, thereby helping her life partners, helping their life partners succeed in creating their own paths. Thank you so much, Jane and Jim. What a treat to have you here and what an honor. Ruth Bader Ginsburg inspired a nation. 
a larger than life force of a woman who is always intentional and precise with her language, famously saying you shouldn't use four words when three would do. And when asked how she wanted to be remembered, she said, whatever you choose to do, leave tracks. That means don't do it just for yourself. You will want to leave the world a little better for your having lived. Well, RPG, you did just that. You left the world a better place. Please now let me introduce Lisa Kathleen Grady, a curator of political history in the National Museum of American History and a proud member of the Smithsonian Women's History Initiative. Thank you, Anthea. I'm a curator of political history. Now, that means that I spend my time thinking about how Americans, and particularly women, interact with their government and their democracy, how they participate, influence, agitate, and affect change both from outside the system and inside the halls of power. The story of Ruth Bader Ginsburg illustrates all of that. We were honored to visit Justice Ginsburg's Supreme Court chambers at the invitation of her family and select material for donation to the museum. We were there on the first Monday in October, the first day of the court's new year. The timing was poignant and underscored our appreciation of the role that Justice Ginsburg played in all of our lives with her questions and dissents. We selected material that reflects Justice Ginsburg's legal career, including arguing cases before the Supreme Court that she would later join. The legacy of her more than 25 years as an associate justice, her fight for equality for all Americans, her crusade for women's rights, and her amazing hold on the public imagination. This new collection will be used by curators for research, exhibitions, and digital outreach to tell the story of Ruth Bader Ginsburg, the story of a strong and courageous woman who fought for and inspired millions. And the collection will have a broader interpretive life as well. The objects of Justice Ginsburg's life will be combined and juxtaposed with objects from national events and other American lives to help us tell stories that put American history in context. Stories of women's rights, of family life, of women at work, of politics and law, of Americans coming together and Americans dissenting. Stories about the issues of equality, rights, and justice that we have adjudicated through the courts, legislated in Congress, and pursued through activism and experienced in our daily lives. The donation will also help us explore how public figures can become touchstones for discussing and understanding those issues some like Ginsburg, even becoming both a popular culture celebrity and a feminist icon. It takes time for objects in a museum to go on exhibit. Until then, material from the Ginsburg donation will be available online on the National Museum of American History's website. It's americanhistory.si.edu. And we'll share them with the Smithsonian American Women's History Initiative. I hope that Justice Ginsburg would like she will be a part of the Smithsonian's ongoing commitment to women's history. Now, please join me in watching this evening's second video that focuses on Justice Ginsburg's role on the Supreme Court and look for a sneak peek at that new donation of objects that are joining the collection of your National Museum of American History. Early in her Supreme Court career, Ginsburg wrote the majority opinion for several landmark cases, including the court's seven to one opinion, declaring the Virginia Military Institute could no longer remain an all-male institution. Stating that, quote, generalizations about the way women are, estimates of what is appropriate for most women, no longer justify denying opportunity to women whose talent and capacity place them outside the average description. Women seeking and fit for a VMI quality education cannot be offered anything less. Ginsburg would say that her model on the bench was Justice Sandra Day O'Connor. The best advice she gave me was when I had colorectal cancer and Justice O'Connor had had breast cancer she was on the bench nine days after her surgery. 
her advice was is typical of Justice O'Connor. Now arrange your chemotherapy on Fridays so that by Monday you will be well enough to, to come to the court. After Sandra left, I felt very lonely. And it was the wrong image for the school children particularly to come in and see this bench with eight men and one very small woman. Now I sit toward the center by virtue of seniority. Justice Kagan is at my left and Justice Sotomayor is at my right. We look like we're all over the bench. We're here to stay. Ruth Bader Ginsburg built a reputation for her erudite arguments, even forming an unlikely friendship with conservative Justice Antonin Scalia. The two often had opposing views, but bonded over their shared love for the opera. They frequently could be found enjoying performances of the Washington National Opera at the Kennedy Center, even sometimes as participants. As the court turned more conservative, Justice Ginsburg became known for her powerful dissents. In 2013, she wrote a scathing dissent on the decision not to renew the Voting Rights Act, stating, quote, hubris is a fit word for today's demolition of the Voting Rights Act. It was Ginsburg's carefully crafted dissents that inspired the name Notorious RBG and the viral fame that continues to this day. Her famous dissent collar is recognized across the nation as a symbol of her courage, integrity, and defense of equal justice under the law. The National Museum of American History Collection is honored to welcome significant artifacts to the national collections, including the dissent collar through a generous donation by the Ginsburg family. The Ginsburg collection includes three other collars, as well as a judicial robe that she often wore. Justice Ginsburg's storied career and impact are an indelible part of American history. She served as a justice until her passing in September 2020. She was a woman of many firsts and a feminist icon. If you want to be a true professional, you will do something outside yourself. That's what I think a meaningful life is. Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, a brilliant jurist who worked tirelessly to create a more just, and compassionate future with equal justice for all Americans. And now a great Americans Medal honoree. Jane and Jim, the National Museum of American History is honored to welcome into our political history collection significant artifacts that represent Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg's Supreme Court career. And as the nation's flagship history museum and steward of the national collections, we thank you so much for your generosity. As Lisa Kit Kathleen said, these objects will help us tell more fully the complex history of the United States and your mother's connection to pivotal moments in women's history, especially the fight for gender equality. At your National Museum of American History, we believe that learning history is a necessity for civic health. It can inspire, engage, and challenge in order to help people understand that today's world is the result of a myriad of choices and actions made by individuals and communities across time. So let's spend a few minutes together talking about the highlights of this incredible donation that you and your family gave us 
and how they connect to your mother's legacy and your memories of her. We are especially honored to welcome into the collections Justice Ginsburg's Maison Bosque judicial robe and four collars, her famous descent collar, her white lace judicial collar, the majority collar, and the polychrome tiled judicial collar. In a 2009 interview with the Washington Post, your mother said, the standard robe is made for a man because it has a place for the shirt to show and a tie. So Sandra Day O'Connor and I thought it should be appropriate if we included as part of our robe something typical of a woman. So can you speak to the intentionality that your mother brought to her collars and choosing them? I think uh, originally uh, the idea was simply to have uh, a complement to men, men's ties. And the uh, original uh, jabot was part of the French lawyer's uh, outfit. Her, her robe from Maison Bosque, uh, which is the principal supplier in, uh, in Paris of uh, lawyer wear and uh, judge's robes, is actually a lawyer's gown, if I remember correctly. It's not a, a judge's robe. Uh, and the, the jabot would be a part of the, the outfit. So in its earliest incarnation, it was just in, in a foreign import to uh, complement the, uh, the men's haberdashery. Uh, and then uh, as, as time went on, she accumulated other collars, particularly, uh, I guess, after uh, 2013 with the advent of the notorious RBG Tumblr, which is when I became uh, a, a real public figure. And then uh, fans started to send columns uh, on a very regular basis. Uh, Mother's uh, Chambers assistant, uh, uh, Kim McKenzie said that there would be weeks when they would get two or three callers a week from, uh, from uh, people in the general public who appreciated her. And then her staff would kind of sort through, make the first cut through all these callers that kept arriving. And then she would choose from among the, the callers that they had initially sorted. And so from you know, hundreds and hundreds, it whittled down to a relative few. Oh, that's mm -hmm. wonderful. Yeah. Jim, do you have any particular memories? Yeah, of one yeah. of the callers? Yeah. One interesting thing is that she would assign roles to different colors. Of course, there was a very famous descent color, which is in a very sort of heavy black and uh, gray kind of uh, dour <laughs> demeanor to the, to the color that matched the that she would have to issue a descent. There's a much brighter um, majority opinion color, uh, which I believe was a gift from her law clerks. I remember a particularly colorful one with a very Southwest flavor that she was given. I uh, was actually there when she was given it in uh, Santa Fe. Her per personal favorite was one, uh, another very colorful one that she got uh, from Cape Town, South Africa. So these really um, made the wardrobe and also helped, uh, I think helped um, 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 journalists because uh, they would see which color she walked into the courtroom mm -hmm. with and, and know which way the case went. Yeah, it's such a wonderful expression of especially women's opinions at simultaneously. Of course, Madeleine Albright is very famous for her brooches and pins and probably the most famous, at least uh, in the Northern Hemisphere, may very well be Queen Elizabeth, mm -hmm. who chooses each of her brooches uh, by day, by meeting. And I, I love that connection of these remarkable <laughs> women choosing that self-expression. And I was able to see all of these materials after they had come into the museum last week, and they are just truly, truly remarkable. And you're right, that robe, Jane, is so elegant with the turned velveteen on the sleeves. And it felt like she, um, she certainly had inhabited those, so it's wonderful. Um, we also collected from you with our thanks, an image of the 118th Congress, um, President Obama signing the Lilly Ledbetter Fair Pay Act of 2009 with his signature. And um, maybe Jane, we can start with you again and, and Jane share anything you'd like to kind of about that, about that moment, about the impact of President Obama being the one 
uh, to sign the, the act in 2009. And of course, just as a reminder, the Ledbetter versus Goodyear Tire and Company, the Supreme Court ruled that Lilly Ledbetter had waited too long to sue for pay discrimination. Justice Ginsburg famously dissented and called upon Congress, quote, to correct this court's parsimonious reading of Title VII. Her encouragement of Lily Ledbetter not to accept the Supreme Court's decision, but to continue in activism resulted, of course, in the legislation that effectively reversed the court's decision so that people could fight paid discrimination regardless of the time limits. So James, what did your mother think were the next steps when cases like Ledbetter were wrongly decided in her opinion? And she seemed to believe in so powerfully in Congress and the court systems of the classic checks and balances and believed in their capacity to create a more, more equal America. So share, share some thoughts on that for us. Well, it depends on the type of case, of course. If it's a constitutional mm -hmm. decision, uh, there's not much Congress can do. But in this case, it was a statutory interpretation and a rather absurd one uh, to say that uh, because the first uh, paycheck that discriminated was years ago, she was out of luck when in fact, as mom wrote, every new paycheck was a new form of discrimination. And of course, there was, she had no way of knowing what was happening until much later. And in fact, what Congress did in that uh, Fair Pay Act is exactly that. They basically put her opinion into law and said, yes, every new <laughs> discriminatory paycheck uh, starts the clock again. And the way she wrote the opinion, there was no doubt that that's what she wanted because she actually wrote, the ball is now in Congress's court. Uh, and the fact that the very first law signed by Obama as president was this uh, a Lily Ledbetter Fair Pay Act, I think, was just such a validation of what mom tried and in this case succeeded in doing. Absolutely. She left quite a trail of big, maybe big breadcrumbs, right? It wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't big. Yeah. Jane, anything you wanted to add to that? No, I think James had it perfect. <laughs> I'm the law professor, but doesn't matter. <laughs> I'm the political <laughs> junkie. <laughs> there you go. I think we all are. Yeah. Um, one of the one of the joys of this collection is its diversity, from everything from the the, re, the regal robes uh, to the popular culture items, so many of which your mom inspired. And um, we have a signed poster from the 2018 movie on the basis of sex as part of the donation. And the movie was written by your cousin, um, which is wonderful, uh, Daniel Stiepelman. And so. Do the scenes as, as they are portrayed, especially of your family life, um, mesh with your experiences of her career? Um, and Jane, uh, maybe as, as the elder child, um, can you start to kind of fill in some of, of, of your childhood experiences with someone who, of course, we revere as, as the great RBG? Uh, well, I, I would say that the there's a, a lot of poetic poetic license taken uh, in the movie, uh, all of which was fine with mother. I think she recognized that the, the real facts were somewhat less dramatic than would be required for, uh, for Hollywood. So for example, the, uh, the culminating scene in the courtroom uh, mm -hmm. in, uh, in Denver, where it, the, her initial argument doesn't go so well, and there's some discussion of maybe uh, father should take the uh, the rebuttal, but uh, she sort of stares them down, uh, goes back up to the podium, and knocks it out of the of the court. <laughs> well, that's dramatically very compelling and uh, completely false. Right? Uh, <laughs> there wasn't even a rebuttal in uh, in the case. Uh, oh, that's yeah. And uh, her her argument uh, uh, it, from the outset went, went went just fine, but obviously that doesn't doesn't work quite so well uh, in a movie. I remember discussing with my cousin uh, why did he depart so much from the facts, and he said, "Well, 
in in a movie you, you have to you have to create tension so even if there there wasn't tension in in real life uh, you have to uh, come up with some I mean, the same thing in the movie about uh, whether there was some discussion between my parents about maybe mother should take a back seat spend more time with the kids uh, none of that <laughs> in, uh, in in real life so that's wonderful. I, you know, it's it's such an incredible opportunity, though, to mirror the, a fictionalized self with a lived self, and and that she embraced the kind of the in between and understood the artistry is is, is wonderful. Yeah, James. Uh, in general, add on anything uh, that your big sister shared, um, or speak to us maybe about family dynamics in in your remarkable family. Well, uh, the movie actually, uh, Jane's being a bit modest here because she has a big role in the movie. In fact, her character is sort of an amalgam of the true, I think it's fair to say, Jane, along with sort of a mom student figure uh, who, who gets to yeah. you know, learn mm -hmm. all about what's going, going on. And, um, uh, and I, for me, I'm just a five-year-old brat running around the, <laughs> the apartment uh, in, in the movie. But um, there's, the story of the movie itself is just such a great example of how mom used uh, examples of how sex discrimination could hurt men. And the reason my dad was involved, it was actually a tax case. It was a deduction that was provided for women, but in almost all cases, not for, for men. Uh, and she showed how discriminatory that was. And uh, I have to put in a little shameless plug because the story of this case um, was actually the a speech my father turned turned it into a really hilarious speech, and my wife, uh, the soprano and composer Patrice Michaels, turned that into a song as part of a song cycle about my mother that appears on the Sadie Records album Notorious R B G and Song. So if you want to hear the four minute version uh, with music of the same story that's told on the basis of sex, I recommend uh, the song on Working Together which is the song actually done in my father's voice as part of a nine song cycle about uh, my mother. Uh, most of the songs are actually based on family. And since you mentioned uh, the part about, you know, the one, once mom decided on her career path, there was no going back. But the one song in that cycle that's uh, based on my grandfather, my father's father, was the one moment of hesitancy my mother had about you know embarking on this because uh, she had Jane as a as a baby at this point and was she really ready to go to law school with all that and he actually and remember this is a, a man in the mid-1950s said Ruth if you don't want to go to law school you have the best reason in the world this baby but if you really want to go you'll stop feeling sorry for yourself and find a way to do it and that really became mom's mo for the rest of her life that's some powerful advice. Yeah. You come from a long line of wise people. Um, <laughs> any other advice that she shared with you that you um, you both want to share with us, to which we can learn? Well, I think uh, what, what I said earlier that, um, and this again echoes uh, her uh, father-in-law's advice, that mm -hmm. there is a way to do it if you're willing to put the work in. And I think mom, more than anybody, <laughs> put the work in and showed you know how it could be done. And I think that's an, been an, certainly an inspiration to me and I think uh, to many others. Absolutely, continues so for all of us. And I think everyone who's watching. Jane, any other good advice that she passed along to you? Uh, that one shouldn't waste time looking back and thinking about how you might have done it differently. Mm -hmm. and she just oh, yes. I call that the tyranny of regret. <laughs> <laughs> it's up there with some of the others. Yeah. Uh, that, those are definitely words to live by. Um, there are wonderful items in this donation representing how much people loved her and how much they admired her for her fight for gender, racial, marriage equality, voting rights, a woman's right to choose. There's an RBG bobblehead doll, a fan's tattoo design, uh, or just two of those objects. And when she started to experience this 
really viral fame. Um, what did what do you remember her reactions were? What were your reactions? Uh, what did she say when she first saw the art for the uh, for uh, the RBG honorary tattoo or or anything else that you uh, would like to share? Uh, I, I think in the beginning she was quite perplexed uh, <laughs> for the tattoo. I think she was appalled, uh, <laughs> which did, did not uh, prevent her from displaying a photograph of the tattoo. Uh, <laughs> although I think it was displayed uh, in her private bathroom in her chambers. So I guess that's having it both ways. Uh-uh. But I, I think she, I think she came to rather enjoy uh, her celebrity, although uh, she certainly didn't didn't seek it out and uh, mm-hmm. didn't think that uh, a uh, five foot three, um, probably more like yeah. one uh, grandmother from from Brooklyn was uh, a likely object uh, of uh, all this adulation. Well, yeah. I think. Uh, yeah. She definitely came to enjoy it and, and, and actually use it because, of course, these were the years of the dissents and more and more she was not going to be on the winning side of these important constitutional and statutory cases. And I think she was able to use her notoriety, as it were, to make the public aware of what was going on. And, uh, of course, uh, the uh, and, and, and thus... And you know, like in some examples, actually, you know, get change from outside of the uh, court. Um, okay. But as far as enjoying it, uh, well, I have to. I had I brought for show and tell the bobblehead actually comes with him without crown. So <laughs> <laughs> that was um, magnificent. Uh, the crown, of course, a reference to the uh, the notorious, notorious. image, a knockoff of the notorious B.I.G. Uh, and I just think to that wonderful CNN documentary that was done about mom. And my favorite scene in that is when she apparently for the first time gets to see Kate McKinnon's caricature of her on Saturday Night Live. And um, we used to mom used to be more dour than she was in her later years. Jane used to keep a book called Mommy Laughed because the instances were so rare. But in this one, is just you can see in that scene, just uproarious laughter from mom at this caricature of her uh, produced by Kate McKinnon, and, and it's really a joy to watch. Well, that's wonderful. You know, it seemed to me, too, tracking her career closely and now learning even more about her over these past number of years, and especially um, since her death that she had been through so much as a, as a woman, um, as a jurist, as a justice, um, the ba- many, many, so many battles she had fought that there was some of that loosening, that kind of unwinding maybe of what had kind of kept her so um, determined. And she was able to still share that determination with so many and yet uh, enjoy and relax into, uh, and then to your point, Jim, to really utilize her fame and her, and I think she kind of was seemingly always some slightly surprised and bemused by just how much of a deal mm-hmm. uh, people made. Oh, that's great. Well, I mean, it was, you know, to go to shows with her and when she would walk in, there would be a standing ovation. People oh, would yeah. literally get up and, and start cheering when she walked into the opera or uh, there, there's the famous story in the show, the relationship between my parents so well, too. Um, they were at the Broadway show uh, Proof. And this, I think, was right after Bush v. Gore. And when mom walked in, the people started applauding. And uh, my father so whispered to her, I guess you didn't know there was a convention of tax lawyers in town. To suggest that it was actually for him. Uh, which prompted a, a nice sharp elbow to the ribs, I'm told. <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. Um, we, you also shared with us, and it's now uh, in the National Collection, about some marvelous artwork from the children's book, Descent. Ruth Bader Ginsburg makes her mark. And so it's the classic, I descent from Justice uh, Scalia, and then the retort, no, I descent. Uh, Justice Ginsburg replies. And their, of course, friendship, despite being on opposite sides of the ideological and, and often 
uh, jurisprudence and political perspectives, um, the justices were, of course, famously friendly and, of course, bonded over opera. Maybe speak to us a bit about this friendship and what it teaches us uh, about your mother. And maybe, Jane, you can go first. Uh, well, one of her famous quotes is that one could disagree without being disagreeable. And I think that uh, was certainly true of, of their relationship. They really had a very deep and uh, longstanding affection for many years. They would spend New Year's together, not just the four of them, but also many children, a lot more on his side than, than on our, ours. Uh, and uh, as time went by, some grandchildren as well at the New Year's gatherings that uh, my father would cook. And occasionally, Justice Scalia uh, would shoot and kill uh, the main course, uh, sometimes uh, requiring a much uh, advanced preparation. Uh, my father would have uh, tubs of marinade for the, uh, for the wild boar uh, or for what he referred to as Bambi. Um, and <laughs> Sometimes this was more successful than others. I think with the wild boar, he ultimately slipped in some uh, regular domesticated pork uh, in order to, to uh, make it uh, consumable. But I think both families certainly appreciated the, each other. And then as to uh, my mother and uh, Justice Scalia, in addition to their great love of opera, which I think James may say a few more, a few more, more things about, I think they also um, really appreciated good writing. And both of them uh, wrote their opinions and uh, both of them were real sticklers for the right expression. Uh, the, the best way to capture the point in the fewest words. And I think that that's something that they appreciated in, in each other. And uh, often they would uh, improve each, each other's drafts, not by doing grammatical line editing, but by pointing out you know, where the arguments were weak or, or unpersuasive, uh, thereby making each other's uh, conflicting points of view better. I think the most obvious example of that uh, was uh, one of mom's most celebrated early majority opinions in the Virginia Military Institute case mm -hmm. where Scalia was the lone dissenter, but wrote a really blazing dissent and uh, did mom the favor of uh, giving it to her early before anybody else saw it so she could address his points in her uh, majority opinion. And she used to say she ru he ruined her weekend. Uh, but her opinion became much uh, stronger as a result. So that was the kind of back and forth, which of course dated back to, the, they were actually on the uh, DC Court of Appeals together even before they were on the Supreme Court. So it was a very longstanding uh, collegial relationship. And of course, that, and speaking, I mentioned that song cycle earlier. Well, this is memorialized in an operetta called Scalia Ginsburg. And Scalia comes first because of seniority, I should note. Uh, which is a very amusing kind of pastiche. Uh, mom does her entrance uh, uh, through by crashing through a glass ceiling, of course. Um, and the idea in the opera is that supposedly these two should be pitted against each other, but in fact, they, they actually work together. And when the uh, other character in the opera is befuddled by this, they, they explain that uh, in a duet at the end, we are different, we are one. That uh, while they're different, they have differing views of how to interpret the constitution, they are one in their reverence for it and for, in their reverence for the uh, institution of the court itself. And, uh, and so in fact, uh, they can be one even if they have opposite uh, judicial and political philosophies. Mm, that's beautifully, um, beautifully said and and remembered, and now of course commemorated. So I can't wait to hear that song cycle. Um, I'd like to. Would you? The composer of the opera uh, is uh, is Derek Wang, uh, who is uh, a a, uh, a composer and also uh, a lawyer. Uh, so he actually got uh, got 
the idea of writing Scalia Ginsburg when he was in law school, reading their opinions and thinking that they actually read like opera libretti. <laughs> that, that was yep. the, the start, start of it. And it has gone through uh, several iterations. Uh, and I believe it's uh, going to be performed at one of the summer uh, opera festivals this year, uh, having been performed in, in prior years as well. No, oh, that's wonderful. How, and how obviously how literate and, be, and exquisite their writings were to be of operatic quality. That's great. Um, for, for my last question, I'd like you, please, and of course with my gratitude, to reflect upon your mother's remarks upon her nomination to the Supreme Court in 1993, and maybe share a bit, if you will, on how you experienced this incredible historic moment as a family. And I'll just read a, a few brief excerpts here. She said, the announcement the president just made is significant, I believe, because it contributes to the end of the days when women, at least half the talent pool in our society, appear in high places only as a one at a time performers. Recall that when President Carter took office in 1976, no woman had ever served on the Supreme Court. And then one more quote. Today, Justice Sandra Day O'Connor graces the Supreme Court bench and close to 25 women serve at the Federal Court of Appeals level, two as chief judges. I am confident that more will soon join them. And then she goes on to say, my daughter Jane reminded me a few hours ago on a good luck call from Australia of a sign of the change that we have had the good fortune to experience. In her high school yearbook and her graduation in 1973, the listing for Jane Ginsburg was under ambition, and her ambition was to see her mother appointed to the Supreme Court. The next line read, if necessary, Jane will appoint her. <laughs> Jane is so pleased, your mother continued, Mr. President, that you did not, that you did it instead, and her brother James is too. <laughs> So Jane, do you remember that that moment when you when you talked to your mom? You were in Australia. Uh, yes, I, I was was actually teaching in Australia, where uh, it, it, the, the Antipodes it was winter while it was summer in uh, uh, in Washington, uh, and uh, I had no idea that this was coming because when I left the country, uh, it had seemed that there were. Uh, other potential nominees who were getting much more play uh, in in the press, and mm -hmm. I had uh, I called home just to check in, and my husband said, uh, "So Clinton has announced his nominee. Do you know who it is?" And I said, "Is it Cuomo?" <laughs> and uh, Mario Cuomo, he said, "No." Right. Uh, is it? I think Bruce Babbitt who was another leading sure. candidate. That's very interior. <laughs> And then he he revealed that it was in fact uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, which uh, was obviously a fantastic uh, surprise, uh, which led uh, to uh, 15 minutes of fame for me in Australia, quite derivatively. <laughs> Uh, and also my son was with me and he uh, created a kind of a, a comic strip, uh, which he titled, My Grandmother uh, is Very Special. And she <laughs> showed that at the, uh, congr at the hearings before the Senate Judiciary Committee. Oh, that's beautiful. And James, you, you were there. So what, what was it like in person? Uh, ju just amazing. Uh... To be there, I was there for, of course, the, that was the Rose Garden ceremony, and um, the, it, it it took a while to sink in that you know that with, because there, there was a lot of in the press back and forth. Would it be this person? Would it be that person? Uh, and to later learn the story of how apparently Mom just wowed uh, Clinton when they finally had lunch together was was great. Um, but I was thinking about what you were reading from her remarks, and uh, this reminds me of a later remark mom made, which people found a little bit shocking, but I think is so appropriate. She was later asked, well, how many women 
uh, you know, should there, uh, um, when, when will there be enough women on this? When will there be enough women on the Supreme Court? And mom said, when there are nine. There are nine. Um, and, you know, when you think about it, people said, that, well, you know, people were, were kind of shocked by that. What, what do you want, really want nine women on the court? But of course, nobody was shocked for cent- dec- decades, <laughs> scores of <laughs> decades, um, when there were nine uh, men on the court. So I think that made the point very nicely about, uh, you know, how our expectations need need to change and uh, how, uh, you know, we're living in a very different world than uh, than the one uh, that existed even just when she was uh, nominated. Yeah, we had, I think her point was we had about 200 years of all male, yep. yeah, of all white male <laughs> Supreme Courts. Yeah, that's, that's a great, uh, a great way to end. And I am, I'm so grateful. Thank you, Jane. And thank you, Jim. And thank you, David. And thanks to all of you who have joined us on this very special occasion. Video from this event will be available on the Great Americans YouTube channel and the website at greatamericans.si.edu. And at your National Museum of American History, our mission is to empower people to create a more just and compassionate future by exploring, preserving, and sharing the complexity of our past. We hope that like us, you take inspiration from Justice Ginsburg's important life's work and embodiment of what it means to be a truly great American.